Hello and welcome to the Bearded Tits podcast. I'm your host, Jack Perks, and today I'm going to be talking to Polly Puller. Polly is a nature photographer, writer, wildlife re- wildlife rehabilitator. Try saying that with a lisp. And I cannot wait to talk to her. But before that, I'm going to actually do something a little bit different this time and talk a little bit about my setup because I've had a few people message me asking, how am I actually doing all of this? So I use a Yeti Blue mic, and obviously microphones are incredibly important for podcasts. And I think the sound comes pretty clear on this, so I'm really, really happy with that. So if you're recording a voiceover or you're recording a podcast yourself, can't recommend the Yeti Blue mic enough. I also have a popper stopper, which stops the (coughs) pops uh, standing out so much, and it's just like a little wiry thing that I put in front of the mic. I keep relatively close to the mic, just so the sound is nice and clear and it can be picked up. And I'm recording in my bedroom, which isn't ideal for acoustics, though once I get my office up and running, uh, that'll be my base of operations. And I've got some ideas that I want to do uh, with that, just to make the video side of these podcasts a little bit more interesting by using better quality cameras and playing around. So that's something to look forward to. Um, I record the interview on Zoom. Zoom's what I use uh, for the YouTube side again, both audio and video. Obviously, the audio goes on the podcast, and then the highlights of the video, that goes on the Wildlife Exposed TV YouTube channel. So check that out if you want to see the highlights of each podcast. I edit it all on Audacity, and then schedule it via Podbean, and it goes out onto iTunes and Spotify as well. So there's lots of different ways that you can listen to it. So I don't go overboard with it. You know, I edit the podcast where I'll take out little bits and bobs, but it's kind of rough and ready, and that's how I like the style. So you might hear me cock up every now and again, uh, but I just leave it in there. Or you might hear my dog barking or something like that, but I leave it all in. I just think it's kind of characterful. Maybe that's a cover of me being lazy. Who knows? But on to my interview today. I had the pleasure of meeting Polly Puller at the Grand Arms Wildlife Book Festival last year. And she was an absolute delight to talk to. So I was equally thrilled when she agreed to come on my podcast. She's written eight books and is a wildlife photographer, rehabilitator, said that very slowly then, and conservationist to name a few. Here's how we got on. So thanks for joining me, Polly. Not at all. Really looking forward to having a chat with you. Yeah, it's been a while, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. And uh, of course, we missed that lovely book festival this year. You know, I was looking forward to going again and... um, but it was all cancelled just about the day before all this. Yeah, it's a shame how this has kind of ruined mm. things like that. But we, we, we struggled. You did a, a book uh, a book fair, didn't you? Did you do an online one? Am I right in yes. thinking that? Um, well, we do a book festival at Malik, um, a right Highland Hooli, which is in November. So we haven't still haven't taken the decision as to whether we're going to go ahead this year. All the authors are in place. I don't think we're big enough yet probably to do it online, but we'll see what happens. Right. You know, we could have to cancel that too, but we'll just remain optimistic. Yes, yeah, you never know. You never know. Um, I'm going to start with your time in Andy Merkin uh, and in particular your interest in pie martins, which were the subject of your book, uh, A Richness of Martins. So what, what attracts you to this mustelid? Well, I'm attracted to all wildlife, really. Um, you know, mustelids are fantastic because they're such a lithe and energetic and extraordinary little predators. And I've always had huge admiration for them. But when I was a child growing up in Ardner Merkin, so at the end of the 1960s, there were no pine martens there, which is really extraordinary to think of now. But there were lots of wildcats still there, which is amazing, but no pine martens. And the first pine martin I ever saw was a dead one. It was brought in a game bag into the public bar of my parents' hotel in Kilhoan. And I just was absolutely intrigued by this because it was so different to the ferrets and things I'd seen. People said it was either a ferret or a mink. They really didn't know what it was. And then one of the old crofters said, oh, I think it might be a Martin cat. And I would have been about seven or eight then. And I just have been fascinated by them ever since and was always really keen to see them. And it took quite a long time before I started seeing them regularly. So Ardner Merkin has now become an amazing stronghold for them. So it's extraordinary how now there's no wildcats in Ardner Merkin, but there are pine martens, so things have all changed. It's sort of reversed, unfortunately, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But I mean, uh, it's, they were so persecuted. I mean, wildcats were persecuted too in Ardner Merkin, but pine martens were just had been driven right out. Uh, they were, everyone said they 
ripped sheep's throats out. You know, these were little animals that people had seen them ripping out the throats of sheep. And I always used to think, my God, what were the people imbibing? You know, were they on <laughs> some sort of wacky backy or sort of <laughs> homemade grog that they were still and you know, legal stills or magic mushrooms? I mean, we're talking about an animal the size of a sort of cat, a small cat, and you know, really to rip a sheep's throat out? I don't think so. They're it not just... angels. No, and it does surprise me the size of them. I mean, I suppose that's about accurate, isn't it? The size of a small cat. But I, um, I saw some at a hide in the Cairngorms. I quite—is it space hide hides? They do like little nighttime. Um, yeah, there's lots of hides. There's, there's a few that do it, isn't yeah. it? And yeah, yeah it, they come in close and take the egg and whatnot. And yeah, I mean, it's probably. As, 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 I mean, I've got a, a very small dog. I've got a sausage dog, but it was about the size of my dog. And I was like, God, they're you know. Sausage dog is probably quite a good. You know, it's a different <laughs> shape. Sausage yeah. dog maybe has a little bit more weight involved. A pine yeah. martin is all muscle. But yeah, yeah I don't really see very many very fat pine martins. So did they come back on their own to Ardenberkin or did they so I, or were they reintroduced? No, they weren't reintroduced. I think what happened was uh, the law came in, the Wildlife and Countryside Act was protecting them. And so, you know, they weren't persecuted to the same degree. I think also the influx of huge amounts of forestry, blanket forestry, which didn't really suit other wildlife, but it did quite suit things like pine martens because it could hide away in that forestry. I mean, it's caused such terrible problems, uh, commercial forestry, but for the pine martin, I think it's, and for things like the fox as well, it's been quite a beneficial thing. And when that um, forestry was beginning to grow, there was fantastic habitat for small mammals before it got really enclosed. So pine martins were able to make quite a good recovery, I think. And, and I think the, just lack of persecution has really, uh, you know, changed things for the pine martin. Yeah, well, I mean, hopefully we'll get them back in England in numbers at some point because, of course, I mean, a lot of people associate them as a Scottish species, but historically they were all across they the British Isles. Yeah, so. absolutely. And I think they're doing quite well in some parts of um, Wales, and they are, aren't they? Back in the Forest of Dean. That, that yeah, that's right. I think. Uh, I can't remember if it was end of last year, beginning of this year, they, they reintroduced a few. Um, and yeah. I know there are kind of unofficial pockets in some of the parts of the of, of England as well. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully we'll get, I'd love to see them back. You know, they can chomp on some of the grey squirrels, hopefully as well. They were amazing. I think the Vincent <laughs> Wildlife Trust are doing a very good job with translocations. And I think they've been taking them from certain areas, you know, under licence. And I think they're doing a terrific job. They did a fantastic job with otters. They've worked with all sorts of amazing species. Um, they're a great organisation. I've always been full of admiration for them. But I think that that's because of their work that they're uh, re-establishing down south. And I think people just love to see them. There's something sort of slightly mystical and magical about pine martens and the fact that they like people, well, not like people, but interact with people. You know, they'll come into your garden and, and I mean, extraordinary. They like strawberry jam and um, you know, peanut. <laughs> well, who doesn't? Yeah, exactly. And um, friends in Arden American who I wrote about, Les and Chris Humphreys, I mean, she bakes Victoria sponges for her pine martens every day. Oh, I might, I might turn up in her garden as well then. Yes, I think it would be fantastic. <laughs> so it is extraordinary. They are so Catholic in their diet. I mean, you know, originally we thought it was just that they just ate hens and red squirrels, but actually that's completely not the case. Though so anything that goes, they'll kind of have a, have a go for, will they? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they do go into, we had one in the hen house um, about 10 years ago. We had a wee hole in the hen house we didn't know was there. Pine Martin went in, to obviously nicked some eggs and wiped everybody out. I think it's typical sort of muster lid when there's a sort of cacophony of panicking hens, then the Pine Martin goes into a frenzy and just kills, you know, so, but um, I'm very philosophical about it. If they take the, my hens through the day, well, that's just bad luck, but we do shut everybody in and we shut everybody in pretty early here because we have pine martens, foxes, badgers, yeah. otters, the odd mink, but very few mink, thankfully. Yeah. So there's a lot of things waiting to uh, have a chicken takeaway. And and the title of your book, A Richness of Martins, is, is that the collective term for pine martens? Yes. yes, it is. And actually the publisher is really keen to have that. And my next book, that I'm supposed to be working on at the moment, but seem to be on a bit of a ghost slope because of the lovely weather. Uh, the next book is going to be called A Scurry of Squirrels, um, about red squirrels. So I'm sort of should get on with that. Well, I'm glad you've mentioned that because that leads me nicely to my next question because your other love is red squirrels, of course. So what is it about red squirrels that just fascinates you? Wow. 
Well, I think actually, um, somebody said to me the other day, what is your favourite animal? And I think the, key, the answer to that is what I happen to be looking at at that moment. I mean, yesterday I was having a complete love affair with mountain pansies, which are, you know, some, it just depends why, likewise, water and flowers and anything. But red squirrels are particularly lovely. They're so, I don't know, they're playful, they're mischievous, they're, they're just extraordinary little things. I suppose as a child, I was the archetypal child who loved um, all the Beatrix Potter books and uh, Squirrel Nutkin was particularly characterful and a bit of a devil you know so and I love that <laughs> because people think um, red squirrels are just absolutely um, angelic but they're not they're really not I mean I've watched them taking uh, blackbird chicks out of nests and um, I mean you know they they're they're not just angels <laughs> they're, pu they're putting it on they're putting a facade on Yes, they are. <laughs> and I always laugh because when I have hedgehogs, because I'm mad on hedgehogs too. And people say, well, don't you have a lot of fleas with hedgehogs? And actually, to be honest with you, I think red squirrels have far more fleas than hedgehogs. Absolutely is, impressed with them. Is that right? Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> Years ago, we were hand rearing some babies, which were only three or four days old when they arrived. And they were covered in fleas. I mean, they were bald, you know, and eyes shut and everything, but still flea ridden. And I wouldn't put flea powder on something that young because it's adding more stress to something that's already in dire straits. But usually the fleas just disappear after a couple of days. We never quite know where they go, but they disappear. <laughs> you saw and you end up scratching a little bit. Well, they don't bite us, but this particular night, I got up in the middle of the night to feed them and had sneaked back to bed. And Eva, my partner, was lying, uh, breathing heavily beside me. And as I got into bed, I felt something crawling on my arm. And I thought, oh, God. And I sort of slapped it and then quietly. And then my slaps got more frenetic. And then after a wee while, Eva said, we're not alone, are we? <laughs> and heart, we to, heart. Go on, sorry. sorry. We had to leap out of bed and pull the bedding back and have a look to see where these fleas were. And he was not amused to have fleas in his bed. <laughs> <laughs> they're hard as nails aren't they i know when my uh, my dogs had fleas in the past like you you can't you try and squeeze them between your i shouldn't advocate squeezing any animal really but you try and get rid of the squee uh, the the fleas and uh, yeah it doesn't phase them they're so tough i know <laughs> they're amazing but did you do you get bitten by your dog fleas because i never get bitten by um them. no i mean she's not uh, she's not flea ridden to be fair so we do treat her for stuff like that but um I get the odd bite, but I've, I, how do you know it's a flea, I suppose, unless you kind of actually see it biting you. But um, I was told they're quite Catholic in their diet. They don't, um, I think they prefer cat blood and, and mammals like that. They don't really go for people as much. No, well, I think they're all, that every flea has a particular host, you know. Yeah. So, uh, you know, obviously hedgehog fleas and things like that. But it's just the thought of it, isn't it, really, and that tickling feeling. I'm, you know, I, I can appreciate the biology of a parasite, but I'm not a fan of parasite. I've had, over the years, I've had ticks and all kinds of weird and wonderful things attached to me, so. Parasites wonderful. They're so fascinating. What, ticks? <laughs> oh, fascinating. And oh. So, but horrible, horrible things. But um, <laughs> I had a, have a red deer here, um, a hind who I've had now for 10 years. She's just about to have her 10th birthday. And she came to us as a 10 day old calf and she had over 200 bloated sheep ticks on her. Wow. Paralyzed totally. And I know that because a Belgian vet and I picked all these ticks off. It was quite shocking, actually. There's a, there's a problem in, uh, in North America with ticks where there's so many ticks on some of the moose that they become almost anemic because they're draining that much blood off them. is a, a huge problem. I think it's because their summers are getting warmer although winters are getting milder sorry and the ticks would normally die off in the winter um so they're having massive tick problems and it's a problem uh, across the world really with, with ticks yeah, I mean, uh, you yeah. know it's all part of nature ticks are, should be there but in huge numbers they can be a can be an issue oh, awful yeah and they do carry so many horrible insidious diseases yeah 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 definitely and you mentioned uh, about how you you look after wildlife and you rehabilitate wildlife so where did all that start well, um, I think it started, uh, we always laugh about it, when I was little, one of my favourite television programmes was something called Daktari, and you're probably too young to remember that. But it I'm was not going to pretend to know what that is. <laughs> it was a wonderful um, programme set in Africa where there was a, this amazing vet and his daughter, and they went around the bush and rescued all these things, and they had a, a pet lion called Clarence the 
um, cross-eyed lion and they had a chimpanzee called Judy and all these things. And they were always rushing around the bush, you know, doing amazing rescues. And so I always wanted to be a vet and I still would love to be a vet, but to just have absolutely no scientific brain whatsoever. <laughs> and um, so really it all started with that. And my mother used to often bring in ailing wildlife and as a child, I was always running around the undergrowth looking for needy fledglings or road casualty hedgehogs and things. And uh, it's just really grown from that. And then I started taking things in. It started off really with um, tawny owls, um, and they remain one of my most favourite birds of all. And kestrels. It's quite interesting now, looking through my record books, when I started doing rehab, so when I was in my mid-teens, when I started doing it on a serious way, um, and kestrels were one of my most frequent casualties. And now, it's in the last five years, I've had one kestrel handed in. It's extraordinary. So you're really. taking that as a sign, sorry, you're taking that as a sign of, of a, a decline in kestrels in your area then? Massive. Well, not in our, in, in Scotland, really, because I, you know, I wasn't always in this particular area. Yeah. yeah. I had an interesting patient this morning and it was very sad because we had to put it to sleep. Um, it was the first time I'd ever had a tree pipit handed in. What oh, a wow. Bird. Absolutely enchanting wee bird. And I felt so sorry that I couldn't do anything for it, but its wing was literally hanging off. So oh, shame, but what a lovely wee bird in the hand. What had happened to it, do you know? I don't know. Somebody yeah. just found it on a, on a path, so whether oh. it had crashed, landed or something had had it I don't know it didn't have any other injuries just a wee broken wing so um, you've so you've got lots of feathers to your cap to kind of not put a pun to it but you know you're a, you're a naturalist you're a conservationist you're a writer photographer um, do you find that there's one that kind of is your is your main uh, interest or is it a case that they all kind of add up to make who Polly is I think that's a very good summary of it, but I sometimes think perhaps if I concentrated on one, I might be better at it. You know what I mean? <laughs> perhaps because I spread things across, perhaps if I was just, just a writer or just, well, certainly on the photography front, you know, I take pictures because I love taking pictures, but my technical ability is not all in. The first to admit that. But, um, and writing, you know, I, I can't, I'm hopeless with commas, <laughs> but yet I've been writing for forever and ever and ever. So it's funny. I just, I think it all goes together, to be honest. And it's all because the rehab gives me stories to write about. And I think the red squirrels, you see really the power that, when you are telling the stories about getting them back to the wild, the power that has with connecting people to nature. And I suppose it was only fairly recently I really thought, actually, all my life, I've um, unwittingly been trying to connect people to nature. And I think that's probably my, my life's work is that, trying to make people see and appreciate. And you will appreciate that with all the wonderful things you see with your fish and underwater. And seeing your pictures immediately makes me think wow you know so you are making that getting allowing people to make that connection and I think that's something really really important for us isn't it yeah I, I like to think that you know people are in maybe not inspired that's probably putting too much emphasis but just people see see my work and it makes them think oh you know next time I'm walking along a river I might take a little bit more notice of yeah. what's scurrying yeah. around um scurrying around down there but we, we talked because we had a quick chat yesterday and we talked a little bit about this but I also think that in, in the current climate with the pandemic going on, it's quite useful having uh, lots of different feathers in your cap because it means that you're not, not, not so reliant on, on one of them. I know, and I think I'm so relieved and um, grateful for having the kind of background in childhood because it does make you much more resilient that you've got things to do. In fact, I thought, well, I'm going to get so much more written work done, and I did to begin with, but now the weather's been so good and you want to go out and take photographs and do this and go and bird watch. And so, yes, it's, it, it is fantastic having these things. And sometimes you feel rather guilty because you know there's so many other people in a far less fortunate situation. People yeah. who haven't grown their own vegetables and done things like that. I mean, we do it every year, mostly for the slugs' benefit. But <laughs> well, some, some, some of my friends uh, run more kind of on the workshop basis, where they're teaching photography or they're guides. And obviously, you know, this has kind of scuppered them completely, so they're oh, yeah. sat twiddling their thumbs. Whereas, yeah, I'm quite grateful that I, I do a little bit of everything. Where it is that a little bit of writing, like you. Um, and things that I can do from home. So I yeah. think it does definitely pay to be versatile and, and not, not throw everything into one camp. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, I've always been able to turn my hand to lots and lots of different things, as long as they're not too scientific. 
<laughs> no, I know. I'm, I've, I've got a very broad natural history knowledge, but yeah, I don't know the, everything about everything. It's more of a kind of... No, I think it's a little about a lot. Isn't yes. It? Yeah, yeah. That's a good way of describing it, definitely. And I think the more you um, t spend time in nature, I just come home and I think, wow, there's just so much to learn, you know, and somebody will phone up and say, you're an owl expert. And I'll say, no, actually I'm not. You know, you, owls, have, I've made a bit of a name for myself, I suppose, with tawny owls in particular, taking them in and hacking them back. But... You, the more you do, the more you realise you know nothing, really. It's yeah. Very yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of the fantastic things I've enjoyed about doing this podcast is every time I'm talking to someone, I learn something new. Every person yeah. I've interviewed is imparting a little bit of knowledge. And I'm like, oh, I never I never knew that. So, you know, uh, we, I did an interview with a, a woman called Victoria Hillman. He's a macro photographer. And she said uh, Britain is one of the few places in the world that differentiates toads and frogs. Everywhere else, they're just frogs. But we have really? names. For, yeah, and I never knew that. They said, so if you go to, I don't know, France or Spain, they're just all frogs. But it's only in the UK where we've uh, kind of separated them. And I guess it's because toads are seen as uh, almost occultists, like there's kind of known for all kind of darker things. And frogs are more kind of happy in uh, fairy tales and whatever. I don't know, it's a weird thing. So just little snippets <laughs> like that. You and I have frogs in common, frogs and toads, because you're passionate about them as well, aren't you? I love my frogs. Yeah, I'm absolutely mad on them. And when the um, the frog and toad season is on, I find myself saying to people, "No, I'm sorry, I've got a meeting," um, which, <laughs> because I need to go to the pond and have my annual frog fix. I just love that fornicating frenzy, and it's just, oh, they're just brilliant, and they're so beautiful. The colours are so different. You know, you can have fifty frogs, and every colour is totally different. There's a little shades of brown and greens and oranges and yellows and other wonderful things. So well, beautiful. I've had my pond for about 15 years now and each year I reckon not well I do recognize frogs each frog's got different patterns so you're like oh there's that one that one's come back and that one's come back and it is quite nice as they're like old friends in a way you see them come back and um I, I was talking to you like a cat got one of my frogs the other day and I was I was so upset I was invested <laughs> in this I've been seeing this frog for the last two months out in my pond and uh, called it Pat. I mean, I'm starting, I'm getting to the point where I'm naming the animals in my garden because I'm spending that much time with them. And I was so upset when I saw this cat catch it. And then he came back a week later. So I like to think he's been on this adventure for all the gardens. I can only assume the cat took it back to its owner and they just let it go. But it found its way back and Pat's none the worse for wear sitting in my pond. So I, I had a rush of joy. Uh, <laughs> and it just shows how invested you can become to, to the wildlife, yeah. you know. Hello. We've got Tony Owls nesting in the chimney, which is about uh, six feet from our house. So in the old bothy next to us, and oh, the activity at the moment is incredible and the noise and there's all these <laughs> things winging in. So I think there'll be some babies coming out any day. We've got three barn owlets we're rearing at the moment too, which are just absolutely brilliant. So Keeping you nice and busy. Opinion. Oh, yeah. It's just <laughs> amazing, really. Yeah. So... Is it fair to call you a journalist? I was going to say a journalist. Is it fair to call you a journalist? You've done journalistic work in the past, haven't you? All the, for, yeah, I do. I mean, yeah, it's, my, yeah. it's my main job. You okay. Know, I do five, five magazine pieces a month, so it's quite a lot. And, and it's some diverse, very diverse um, reading material, if you see what I mean, different audiences. So my question is, you, you must have reported on many nature, sto uh, many nature stories. Have there ever yeah. been times when you've had to investigate something that's maybe clashed with your own uh, oh, morals or interests? Yeah, all the time, all the time. Um, and I think sometimes when I used to work for one particular magazine, I would often have to write about something uh, sort of shooting the con controversy between shooting and conservation. And there's just such a big gap with that, you know, that people don't speak a lot of the time. I think the most important thing is to listen to both sides of an argument and both stories. and if I really have strong views either way, then I really, really try um, to put those aside and just, as long as it isn't coming across as if it's my view, if it's somebody else, I'm very happy to just let them I'll be the, the, the vehicle to get the words out. But because it is important to hear both sides of everything. And I grew up in a, a, an environment in Arden and Merkin where, um, you know, you, you did shoot things for the pot and you went out and you did, th you know, and things did get culled. Blackback gulls used to be a nuisance with sheep and, and crofters would go and pot them off and things like that. So, and then my, some of my family were very keen shooting. I mean, I'm just completely against that now, but it doesn't mean to say I can't understand that some people 
people like to, you have to listen to both sides of the argument and of course here there's all this huge controversy with beavers you know and yes I, yeah i mean we're surrounded by beavers here and um i saw something on um a community web page this morning which is concerning me is that somebody has posted a whole lot of stuff saying that beavers attack children so we're going to have to get on top of that because you know they don't need bad press it's bad enough as it is really that's the trouble with with social media in a way isn't it it's a double-edged sword because you can yeah. promote good messages very quickly and very easily <laughs> but you know to kind of quote donald yeah. trump the whole fake news um people can post something like that and then within a very short period uh, everyone thinks oh beavers hunt, you know hurt children and when it's obviously not the case but people are just going to take that for gospel I know, and that's the problem. And I mean, it's, it's people still tell me that red squirrels hibernate. So I mean, you know, people don't, you know, they often spread things which really aren't true. So to go back to your question about writing about things, it is important to listen to other people. But I, but I think sometimes I do struggle, and I'm not ever prepared to put a very heated argument out from myself because I think sometimes the way you make connections is is to listen. And is to hear, I mean, sometimes I get so upset about some of the things, you know, that raptor persecution really infuriates and upsets me. Um, but, you know, it's, it's very difficult. It's really, really difficult. And I just don't know if we're going to resolve it. I'm sure Isla will have lots to say on the matter because she has studied that. She studied that conflict. So yes, you her in a podcast. I think she said you were doing that today too. Isn't it? Yes, we yeah. are. So Isla's going to be talking precisely about that, the conflict between yeah. um, conservationists and gamekeepers. But it are. is difficult because the two sides are so... Um, but it can't go on, you know. Um, I feel very, very strongly that it can't go on. We can't go on annihilating our wildlife. We've got to start changing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah. a tricky, you know, tricky it's issue. Gonna, it's not going to go overnight. You know, we've got a lot of work to do. But it is yeah. in, important, as a, if you want, is to have a bit of a balance. You've got to understand both sides of people's argument. Yeah, and I think um, I think that's what she did very well, and that's where she kind of got in there. So that'll be it'll be interesting to hear her podcast. So that's going to be out uh, the week after yours, I think. So anyone listening to this, the next podcast will be about the conflict there. Um, I'm, job. I think it's great, and I love <laughs> the title of your podcast. I think the bearded tits. You know. <laughs> When I first met you, Jack, I thought there's a guy who doesn't take himself too seriously, but is seriously good. So no. that was, was well, a I, good title. No, well, I, I try and add a bit of humour and, uh, and not take myself seriously because wildlife can be a little bit stuffy at times. Um, oh, and yeah. I just try and introduce a little bit more of a lighthearted viewpoint um, on it all, it's really. It's really important to do that, yeah. I'm going to end on this last question for you. So you've worked with many iconic Scottish creatures um, is there one that you haven't written a book about? So I know you've done Pine Martins, you're doing Red Squirrels. Is there one that you'd like to write a book about? Well, I did Fauna Scotica, which was an awful little about an awful lot of yeah. all, you know, Scotland's animals and birds. And I suppose, no, I just finished a memoir, which has been really, really a long journey. And um, there's a lot of wildlife things in that, as well as lots of personal stuff. So I'm sort of slightly written out at the moment. I think when I, <laughs> I can do a half decent job on the Red Squirrel book, I'll be well pleased. I suppose I would love to have written a book on tawny owls and owls in general. But having said that, the market is fairly saturated with owl books, personal owl stories, as well as scientific ones. So I, I, there's nothing else writing wise at the moment that I really want to cover. I mean, you say iconic species. I mean, everything. Our, our wildlife is so fabulous. It just, I mean, even the little dunnock, take the wee dunnock that comes to the garden and lots of people in towns will be able to see now, country town everywhere. I mean, there's a little bird with an extraordinary life that people don't know about. I mean, do you know about dunnocks? I don't know a lot if I told you. I know some people call them hedge sparrows. I know they're not a sparrow, but that's another name for them. But I told I, you that they had a menage a trois, and it's one female with two males, and uh, there's a lot of skulking in the undergrowth, and um, one male will mate with the female, and then the other one will come along and uh, deal with what has been mated with and uh, peck, peck out the sperm from the cloaca of the female, and then he will mate with her. So the wee female dunnock, that little brown, so-called boring little bird, doesn't know who her father of her children is. Wow. So, I mean, 
wildlife, you know, you talk about iconic things and we're very focused on the big things, but the wee things are fantastic too. Well, so, I, so when I... Really Sorry, when I interviewed uh, Stephen Moss, he, we were talking about this, he did a book about the wren. And obviously yes, that's... I love that book. And it's and, and basically what you've just described. It's not the first bird you'd think of to write a book about this little brown jobby, but people, I, I think it did really well. He was really happy with it. And it just it goes to show production. you can do it. It's a lovely production. I love the pictures and it was, it was very good. I, I um, enjoyed a lot of the stories in there. In fact, I gave him a story for that book because when I used to, um, I was a groom working with a lot of Highland ponies for a while. And I used to go over to the blacksmith for these Highland ponies and the old um, blacksmith was quite a character. And there was a, a hook of horseshoes and the wren had used this, the formation of the horseshoes to build its lovely little mossy nest. And the blacksmith had just left um, those that size of horseshoe on the wall until the wren had fledged all her chicks and it was so funny it's amazing lovely they're beautiful they little birds they are yeah i don't think they get quite the uh, appreciation they deserve no but there's so many things that are just fascinating when you start to look up at them close you know bullfinches in the garden this morning having a go at the apple blossom wow there's the the males are stunning at the moment just in their full breeding outfit it's really lovely they to watch. they're phenomenal i do i do love a bullfinch i can't fault them on that um what about male blackbirds singing at the moment have you got them singing with you um i think they must be i mean i must admit i'm missing the dawn chorus most mornings and i should get up really uh -huh. is that because you're lying <laughs> in your bed uh, yes <laughs> which i've got no excuse because obviously i'm not i'm not exactly swamped with work at the moment so i should get up and and breathe it in but there are a pair of blackbirds um that come into my garden and every now and again so I should come and listen to him, really. Yeah. At the moment, are you in Nottingham or? I, yes, so I, I, I'm in uh, mm. Nottingham just outside of the city centre. So it's not too busy where I am. It's kind of suburban to a degree. But uh, I never used to think I got that many birds in my garden. But because I've spent two months just staring out, I'm starting to establish characters. So there's starlings that go and pick out all the crane fly larvae out my lawn. And there's some great tits nesting at the bottom of the garden. So... I get, get a, a little bit of urban wildlife, not huge amounts, but a bit. That's well, look, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, uh, Polly. And you. Lovely. And I'm sure we'll, we'll meet up again at some point. Bye. Well, that was Polly Puller. And that brings me on to Nature Reserve of the Week. And this week I'm going to do Lock and Daub. In Gaelic, Lock and Daub means lock of trouble. And there's been certainly a lot of trouble at that lock over the years with various civil wars and wars against the English. Although on Wiki it says lock of minnows, uh, which is interesting because minnows are an introduced species of Scotland. So I think that's one of those kind of Wiki facts that you don't really want to listen to. However, it does earn that name because the lock is full of minnows as well as wild brown trout and pike, which were introduced there as well. It's around 6.5 miles northwest of Granton on Spey and is a must for any wildlife photographer in the Highlands. One of my favourite things about this location is that you can take some fantastic images without even leaving your car. Now I know that sounds lazy, but the wildlife there is used to cars, so it doesn't disturb them. And with the Scottish weather being temperamental at best, this is a great place to go when the weather is a bit shit and to keep dry in the car. Because the road goes right up against the lock and right up against the heather, you're incredibly close to many different species of wildlife and you can get some decent shots with around a 300mm or so is ideal. Depending what time of year you go, there'll be different things to photograph. In the summer, you stand a good chance of seeing black-throated divers. These are protected, so be aware you can't go chasing them around, but if you're parked safely by the lock, there's no reason you can't poke your binoculars or a camera out for a quick shot of one passing by. There's also lots of waders in the area and a good colony of common ghouls as you enter the area. Birds of prey like hen harrier, buzzards, even eagles have been seen. And although it's not hilly, the odd mountain hare turns up as well. But by far the biggest attraction for here is red grouse. It's chock full of them and you can get some fantastic images of these game birds, whether they're displaying earlier in the season whether it's very wet and windy and get more dramatic shots, or going around in the snow, this is the place to get shots of red grouse in the Scottish Highlands. Now, it's not a nature reserve in the strictest sense, so pretty much it's a road you drive around 
that's it. There are no facilities here. So again, this is more of a hardened photography place. Bring all the things that you need. There are little pass areas that you can go along because most of it's single track, but there's passes every few meters, so it's not too difficult if there's another car coming along. But it is well worth a visit. You could spend the whole day there, but it's one of those places that you can spend a decent morning and probably come away with some really nice images. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed today's podcast. This has been the Bearded Tits Podcast. I've been your host, Jack Perks, and I will catch you in the next one. Cheers.